So my guest today is Mike Podesto. Mike is the founder and CEO of Find My Profession. His career in Vice has been featured on sites like Forbes, uh, Times, Fast Company, and Zeti. And when he's not working, you can find Mike hiking, climbing, or biking one of Colorado's gorgeous mountains. How would we find you there? The mountains are huge. <laughs> Mike, welcome. Thanks for making time today. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me, Jeff. It's an honor to be on the show. Thank you. So um, how would you suggest someone position themselves in order to be proactive in their job search and get results? Yeah, sure. So I like the word proactive. I'm a big believer in being active in your job search versus just hoping that recruiters and hiring managers are going to come to you and offer you positions. Um, usually that's not how it works. Um, so a lot of people think that the best approach to being proactive in a job search is going on job boards, finding these jobs, and then filling out applications. Um, but the problem is everybody's doing that, and that really doesn't do much to set you apart. Um, so here I kind of want to share a little bit of like how you can go about job searching and doing things different than the average person does. Cool. So what should they do? So I'm a big fan of LinkedIn. So at my company, Find My Profession, we have a fully managed job search service where we will do all the work for our clients to find them jobs. We find the jobs, apply to the jobs, network for them, do interview prep, everything. Um, and a big focus that we have is on using LinkedIn to network for the jobs that you want. So after you filled out the application and found the job that you're looking for and applied, a lot of people just stop right there and wonder, wow, I've filled out 50 applications and I've just got a bunch of automatic rejections or I haven't got one call back for an interview. And they wonder why that is. Um, the solution to that and the way that you can get way more interviews callbacks is by networking and particularly using LinkedIn to do that networking. Um, I like LinkedIn because it's a pretty much free tool. You can pay for the paid plan, but you can do a whole lot with just the free service um, to find a job. So what I recommend that everybody does is after applying to a job online, they need to find out who the decision makers are at the company and LinkedIn is the best tool to do that. It's essentially a huge org chart for companies um, publicly available at your fingertips to discover exactly who the hiring manager is for the role, some of your peers would be for the role, and then reach out to them via messages on LinkedIn, letting them know that you're interested in the position and asking to schedule a time to speak. Um, so how do you find the specific one for the specific role? And folks, we're not talking about HR here. We're talking about the hiring manager. Exactly. Yeah, good point. So there's so many recruiters and age people getting pitched all the time, and they're kind of tired of it. You don't really want to reach out to these people. We're trying to bypass them and go straight to the source, the hiring managers or peers. So the best way to figure it out is... Um, look at the job description. Usually in the job description, maybe about 10% of the time, it'll say who it's reporting to. That's rare and you're lucky if it tells you the exact title or name of the person it reports to. That's an easy one. You can reach out to them. Usually it's not going to tell you exactly who to reach out to though. So it takes a little digging. Um, so you're just going to read the job description try to understand what team you're working on. So the larger the company, the harder it is. If it's a hundred person company and it's a marketing manager position, you can assume it's gonna to report to a marketing director or a marketing VP, whoever is right above that role in the kind of order of hierarchy. Um, for a big company like Amazon, it can be hard to figure out who the hiring manager is, especially if it's a vague title, like a project manager. So what you'll wanna do is look into detail in the job description and figure out if it identifies what team you're working on. So it might say, this is a project manager position on the Alexa AI team. Now you can use those keywords when you're searching in LinkedIn, you search by Amazon employees, you're gonna see 300,000 results or whatever it is. And then you search Alexa AI. Now that narrowed the 300,000 down to 300, okay? my Alexa is communicating right now because she hears me saying her name, but um, <laughs> from there, you now have 300 results, which is still a lot, right? So this, this is a project manager position. You can assume that it's going to report to either a senior project manager, a project director or something. So you just start playing with those 
additional keywords that are hierarchy keywords. So a manager usually reports to a director, a director to a VP, a VP to a CP or a C-level person. And once you do a little bit of digging on LinkedIn, you can kind of see how their hierarchy is and figure out what those titles are. Um, so I'm going to yeah. interrupt you here just to, to deal with the mechanics. And the mechanics might be go to the search box on your LinkedIn homepage. Mm -hmm. Enter um, uh, the title for the role that you think it might report to. Do I have that right? You do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then from there, are you going to, and again, filters, you know, you get better filters with one of the paid versions of LinkedIn, but on the free one, you got some basic filters you can work with. So you have the company filters, you got the geography filters, I believe. I don't remember the others because I'm a paid user, but sure. I think the idea is you're working your way up the food chain to identify someone who might have that specific uh, title for the role as a way of yep. reaching out to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it really depends. I'd normally be first looking for jobs to apply to because mm -hmm. rather than just cold outreach, these are warm positions. You know the hiring manager has a need for this position, so you get the best results by reaching out to a hiring manager that has a position open right now than just no position. So let's say you just went on LinkedIn, you go to the jobs tab and you applied to one of the jobs. I see uh, floor and decor is looking for a chief executive merchant in training, right? So from there, I can click on floor and decor, decor the link that LinkedIn provides. And then I can click, you know, view all employees. There's 4,237. Um, from there, if I know that that position is gonna be in Denver and I'm assuming that it's a, not a remote role or I read that it's not a remote role, I know my manager is likely to be in Denver as well. I can filter by location. Denver, Colorado just brought the, it was 3,900 results down to 36 results. So I already have a really nice short list of people that could potentially be my manager for that role. Now, since I know this was a chief executive merchant and training role, really I'd take a deep, deeper dive into the job description um, to kind of see what I can learn about it and try to find keywords that I can search LinkedIn for. But I would probably be looking for um, the word merchant in here. And out of those 36 results, only three of them have the word merchant. And one of them's title is chief executive merchant, women in leadership. And since this is a chief executive merchant in training role, good chance that this chief executive merchant either knows who the hiring manager is or is the hiring manager. But either way, it's somebody that I wanna to talk to. So I can reach out to Ashley, who's the chief executive merchant and say, hey, Ashley, I'm super interested in this position. I just applied to it. I'd love to schedule a time to chat and learn a little bit more about the role and tell you why I'd be a good fit. Now, whether she's the hiring manager or not, Ashley should take a little bit of time and possibly will to speak with me and either tell me about the role, which could be useful information for an interview because I'll get some inside knowledge into what the position's about. If she's a peer um, or if she's the manager, I'm talking directly to the source and can try to sell myself on why I'm a good fit for this position. And LinkedIn's great because it's really the only place that you can do a search like this and get a full list of almost every employee at the company, their titles, they relate to the job that you're interested in applying to. And sometimes I know you can use some text uh, in order to filter. So for example, if you're not finding the right titles for whatever the reason, you might pull some text from the job description and see if you can identify the person that way. Uh, because you know, in their description about their work, they may be using the same language. Exactly, yeah, and the, and the description in the hiring manager's uh, job description section on LinkedIn, sometimes they'll be saying stuff. Yeah, exactly. That one's so much fun. It's kind of like when you, if you're trying to find uh, where a job is that a recruiter is looking for, sometimes they're a little lazy and they don't make enough changes to the job description. So they just do a copy and paste when they post. Mm -hmm. And thus you can find the original organization because they're running the same app. Yeah, I've done that countless times. Yeah, you're saying you copy and paste the job description from a recruiting agency that's hiring for some unknown company. 
you paste it into Google and you can find it on that company's website exactly word for word. Yeah, we do that all the time as well. Um, because again, you're getting to the source versus a recruiting agency. A company's probably more likely to hire you when they don't have to pay some 30% recruiting placement fee attached to it when you're the same person. So, um, And folks, if you're listening to this as a podcast, as we've been talking, Mike has been having this huge smile on his face because he's really enjoying you know, talking about what it's like to do this and how to go about doing it. So he obviously enjoys this. He's good at it. And we're going to talk about more ways you can be proactive, perhaps using LinkedIn, maybe using Google whatever. So we're, so far, we've been talking about how to suss out, I love that phrase, suss out the hiring manager on LinkedIn. What else can people be doing to uh, be proactive with searching? Yeah. So before moving on from LinkedIn, there's the same process of what you're doing, but reaching out to peers is great as well. So we like to do outreach for our clients to peer type roles, as well as hiring managers, slightly different message for each, you know, a hiring manager you want to speak to so that you can try to pitch yourself and get an interview. A peer, it's more of a discovery call. Hey, notice that you're in such and such position. I recently applied to it. Looks like an amazing role. I'd love to hear your experiences at so-and-so company in this position. More often than not, people, when they think you're not trying to pitch them on something and just interested in learning about their company or their role, they're happy to speak to you and tell you what, what they think about the role. And usually the ones that aren't happy to speak to you and tell you about the role don't love their job that much. And maybe you shouldn't be applying to that job in the first place. But usually people who are passionate about their job and what they do are pretty happy to get on a phone call with you and tell you about it. Um, so that's a great way to prepare yourself for the actual conversation with the hiring manager, because you can say, yeah, I spoke to, you know, Jeff over at so, so I know he's in the same role. He told me that he really loves it. He told me X, Y, and Z about the role. So you already have a basic understanding of what the role's like, um, have already talked to somebody at the company to kind of name drop when you're speaking to the hiring manager. There's a ton of value in that as well. And I'm wondering, you know, I've always said the dirty little secret of LinkedIn is that unless someone's looking for a job, they're not always on the platform and they're not always responding. What do you run into in your work doing uh, what I believe is called reverse recruiting? That is mm -hmm. trying to help you know, represent someone, not an employer, but represent an individual and, and uh, direct them through the process. Yeah, I think more and more people are using LinkedIn. Uh, usually there's some indicators on their profile if they're going to respond to you and be active or not. So when I go to a profile of somebody I want to reach out to, like a hiring manager, and they only have 13 connections on LinkedIn, and their profile looks like it just hasn't been updated, you know, they have no description in what they do. It's 1997 to present for their last job. And it's just very little information, no endorsements, no recommendations good chance that they're not just ignoring you when you reach out to them. It's probably like uh, more likely that they just don't go on LinkedIn ever. Um, that's somebody that I would probably go out and use a tool like Hunter to go find their email address and then Hunter, send them an email. Hunter directly. is a Chrome extension, as I recall. It is. Yeah. You can use it as a Chrome extension or just the desktop like application. Yeah. And thus what that's able to do is to find an email address for someone. Am I correct? Yeah hunter.io sometimes there's some guessing or sometimes you have to connect with somebody else at the company to get the email sequence and understand if it's first initial last name at company name.com um, but same exact message you're sending on linkedin you can do via email um, linkedin is my go-to preference because they can see your face they can read basically your resume on linkedin right away before they even respond so it's very little pressure for them and they can kind of see what you're getting into before they respond email can seem a little more you know, pitchy, cold outreach email while LinkedIn seems more personalized. Um, but for those people who don't use LinkedIn at all and are only going to be using email, they're probably a little bit more okay with, with getting an email. So, and I'll just remind you folks, you know, they're online on LinkedIn when in messaging, uh, you see a little green dot that lets you know they're online. Doesn't mean they're actually at their computer, doesn't mean anything more than they're online on LinkedIn. And when they walk back to their desk or kitchen table, as the case might be, they'll see that someone sent them a message. Mm -hmm. And not everybody has that feature turned on either, right? So just because you don't see the green dot also doesn't mean they're not on LinkedIn right now. They could be. 
Interesting. I didn't know you could turn that off. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be surprised about that. <laughs> so, so what else can people do proactively to reach out, find work, be aggressive? So a big thing I like to do as well for applying to jobs, because if you're going to do all this work job searching properly, which is doing this networking I'm talking about, you might as well make sure it's for jobs that um, are actively available. So I look at the date that the job was posted pretty frequently. And I always use the filter when I'm searching to do like seven to 14 days max for a job. They will default usually to 30 plus days. So you can see things from a month ago. And at the time the company is you know, about to take that down because they're already done and they just haven't got to it. So you take the time to fill out an application and it was just wasted 30 minutes of your time for nothing. Or they already have a short list, they're interviewing, but they're keeping the job open just in case they need to filter through more applicants later. Um, but then they end up hiring somebody and you essentially wasted your time applying. So I will look for jobs as fresh as possible, usually seven days. If I'm actively job searching, it'll be seven days. If I'm starting a job search, I might do 14, 20 days to start to see if there's anything out there. But if I'm searching weekly, every week for jobs, I only need to do a seven day filter if I'm searching weekly because I'll be catching everything new that pops up. So yeah, that's a big one. So if someone is in the habit of using Indeed to find jobs, they can circle back to LinkedIn and do the exact same thing, right? They can find the hiring manager. They can do the outreach there. They don't have to apply on Indeed. No, or on LinkedIn. Yeah, no, they don't. They, we use every job search site that is at our fingertips, depending on the client. So if there's a very niche client, um, you know, USA jobs or federal jobs, they're not going to be on LinkedIn at all. It's all going to be through USA jobs. You hop on LinkedIn after do the networking, same with special niche sites, you know, remote sites, virtual locations, engineering sites that have engineering specific jobs. We'll use all those job search sites to find the positions that are available, but then we're going to hop back over to LinkedIn because again, the one tool that you really should be using, no matter what job search site you're on to find the org chart and the hierarchy for those companies and reach out to people. You happen to mention USA Jobs, the federal job site. Mm -hmm. And in that particular case, it's, it's one of the few times I tell people do apply mm -hmm. because you do actually have to apply. You can't do an end run around the system to begin the application process. You do have to do it in that formal way and then you can do the end run afterwards, right? Yeah, they're very strict on federal jobs. And actually, the whole networking strategy on LinkedIn is still effective, but much less effective for federal jobs, because a lot of those jobs are so by the book, they can't respond to you and schedule a discovery call just to be nice with you like they could for some corporate position, because they have very strict rules to follow to make sure everything's fair and uniform. So it's still better than not doing it on federal jobs. But we tell our federal clients that if they are going to use services, expect that it will be a little bit less effective and take a little longer on average than a non-federal job search. The difference between non-federal and federal in terms of time, what would you say? I mean, we've had federal applications that take four hours to fill out an application um, because they're just so extensive. Sometimes they require additional documents like uh, certain narratives, ECQs, um, MTQ and MPQs, MTQs. Anyways, um, what is an ECQ? Just so I know, uh, executive core qualifications, and they they just have acronyms for everything, but they're extremely detailed. Basically, five one-page documents describing how you have uh, certain skills, basically, and. and, and putting it, your career into it. We provide ECQ writing services for clients, but we have, you know, very specialized, dedicated writers on staff for that. 99% of resume writers and those professionals cannot and do not write federal resumes or ECQs. It's very specialized. Gotcha. So getting off the federal stuff <laughs> and just being, you know, circling back to LinkedIn uh, and other 
non-government work. What other things can people do to be more proactive? What other tools should they employ? What other techniques should, should they engage in? Tell us everything. Please tell us everything. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, of course, your profile has got to be up to par if you're going to be utilizing LinkedIn to do a lot of this network, right? So that uh, kind of goes without saying, but I'll touch on that. Like, You need to have an updated, nice looking LinkedIn profile. So that means your most recent positions, probably a nice you know, background photo, a nice professional looking photo, um, some relevant skills on your profile. I mean, just fill it out. LinkedIn pretty much walks you through how to have a complete profile. There are professional companies out there um, that you can hire to write your LinkedIn for you, um, but a better LinkedIn is gonna you know, do wonders in the outreach because a lot of people will look at your profile first if you're pitching a hiring manager and then see if they think you're even a relatively good fit for the position before responding to you to say, yeah, sure, let's get on a phone call. And if you're applying to a director of operations job and your last three job titles are, you know, sales manager and marketing manager, they're going to look at your profile and say, this person is not a fit at all. I'm probably not even going to respond. Um, so just making sure it's up to date um, is a big one. Um, another thing is the jobs that you're applying to. Um, you could do everything that I'm talking about, but if you're not applying to the right jobs, you're probably not going to have a lot of success. People aren't going to want to schedule calls. Um, like I said, if you're not a good fit for the position. Um, so yeah, I don't want to say anything about that. So in terms of profile, I always tell people, your profile and your resume have to be somewhat congruent. They don't have to be identical, but if someone were reading your resume and then going to your profile, as is the habit that most organizations have, they're going to see something that gives them the idea that you're telling them the truth in the resume mm -hmm. and that you actually have the expertise that you profess to have in the resume. Yeah. Yeah, that's true because the LinkedIn is very public. You can't really be lying on there because you can have past employers or people that you worked with looking at your profile and saying, wait a second, you weren't that title and you didn't do that. You could maybe make some stuff up on your resume, but on your LinkedIn, you'd be getting called out potentially by people if you were just publicly lying. Um, and yeah, they are consistent. The main difference would be, you know, on your LinkedIn, it could be a little less formal. You could probably use like I statements, you statements, things like that. While on your resume, you may take out some, some things like I, um, you know, I did this, I did this. Um, but yeah, they're pretty much going to have almost identical content so that somebody doesn't look at it and say, this is confusing. You said you did this on your resume, but this on your LinkedIn, trying to connect the dots here and I don't understand. Um, and if there's ever any confusion with a recruiter or hiring manager, they usually don't take the time to get the clarification from you. They just move on right away. So, And if you're watching on video and you saw my finger go down, that was the buzzer for the trap door to send the chair backward and you into the moat. Um, yeah. They're not going to take any time to try to understand the confusion here and get to get to know you better. It's very quick. There's hundreds of applicants for every job. And if it's not fairly clear from the beginning, chances are they're moving on. And once you're doing the update to your LinkedIn profile, I'm going to remind everyone that LinkedIn does sell a product to recruiting firms and to corporations that allows them to search the entire database. And thus, you know, this is the notion of being the passive job hunter that I know as I was involved in creating this myth many years ago. Uh, it's the notion that people who are not actively looking for work are superior to the ones who are actively looking for work. <laughs> and the concept is, you know, you want to attract people to you. And thus, if they find you and you're not applying, that's a good thing to them. They think you're not actively looking for work, even though you may have the same resume on 27 job boards. Uh, and mm -hmm. you may have it posted in lots of different places and you are being aggressive. So, the things that you do to draw people to you and your profile, remember your profile is like a resume. Uh, so do things so that your resume will get attention and also do things that draw recruiters, corporate or third party to you as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And LinkedIn has a feature, I believe, where you can say that you're open to opportunities and what kind of opportunities you're looking for. Um, so that, that people, you know, recruiters and such can more easily find you as well. 
That's the open to work little ring around your picture that shows up. Uh, that I'll, that's again, I think a filter that the, the they have on LinkedIn Recruiter, so they can first screen those people and then go to others. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in a in an ideal world, yeah, you could not be super actively applying and be getting people reaching out to you for jobs, but more often than not doesn't happen unless you're in a super niche field and somebody's searching, you know, uh, I don't know, aerospace mechanic engineer in, you know, some small town in the middle of nowhere. And you're the one person on LinkedIn who pops up and they reach out to you. But more often than not, as the world becomes smaller, there are hundreds of people with the same search terms or same skill set as, you know, you or anybody searching for a job and it's hard for recruiters or headhunters to just find inactive job seekers try to pitch them to leave their company and all of those things so yeah it would be ideal but um, doesn't always happen so big fan of the proactive approach yeah proactive passive you got to do both Uh, as as someone said so uh, so well many years ago uh, have, sending your resume out is for when you want to be the hunter and mm-hmm. you know, having your profile and attracting to you is for when you want to be hunted. You mm-hmm. want both to be going on concurrently. You mm-hmm. want to be aggressive. You want to be passive. You want to do the things that are going to make you attractive to firms. Uh, and what else can they do? Come on. You got other things. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, We break our job search for our clients down uh, into weekly, uh, basically things that we do. So every Friday we go and we look for jobs for our clients. So that's just job searching. So we kind of touched on making sure you're finding jobs that are going to be a good relevant fit for you. Um, A lot of people think, oh, this is a great job. I'm even overqualified for it. And they think those are worth applying to. More often than not, they aren't. Um, Usually being overqualified does not mean you're going to get the job. I know people struggle and wonder why, man, I applied to these 10 jobs. And if anything, I'm overqualified. They'd be lucky to get me for that dollar amount and with the amount of years I have. And then they don't get calls and they're sad and they wonder why. And it's just the way it is. Um, You're probably more likely to get a job that you're underqualified for trying to move up a little bit than a job that you're overqualified for trying to move down. Companies think you're going to be dissatisfied long term. That you're just too settling expensive. You find something too or too expensive. Yeah, you're either too expensive, but, but you might not be. You might say no, no, no. I happily work for that amount. I'm not too expensive. But then they have a uh, kind of insecurities where they think, oh, he's going to want to leave or she's going to want to leave or you know, this, once she gets a higher paying opportunity, more like what she should be at, she's going to leave. And you know, if you're a company that provides a good lifestyle. Um, They should not be insecure about things like that because people will take pay cuts to go work for a better employer, a better company, have better freedom of lifestyle um, and things like that. So um, applying to relevant jobs that you meet the criteria for, not that you're overqualified or under, you know, super underqualified for um, is key. So Friday, we find jobs for our clients. Monday, we apply to the jobs. One thing we haven't touched on is when we're applying to jobs for clients, we do spend maybe 10, 15 minutes extra customizing the resume slightly for each of the applications we submit on their behalf. Um, So this is slight, slight changes. So maybe reorganizing bullet points to emphasize things that are more fitting in the job description higher up in the list than lower, or just altogether, you know, removing some bullet points, not because they didn't happen, but because they're just not relevant to that role. No reason to share irrelevant information. Um, So a resume doesn't need to be everything you've ever done. It should be everything you've done as it relates to the position you're applying for. Um, So that's, that's something big that we do for our clients is customize the resume for them. We usually have a little headline or heading section on the top of every resume and we'll match the exact job title with that headline. So if it's, you know, vice president of marketing or chief marketing officer, we're not saying what their title is, we're saying what their desired title is up at the top of that resume. So we'll put the exact job title of the job we're applying to. Oftentimes we'll even save the resume file with that job title. So it's Mike Podesto, CMO, um, Mike Podesto, VP marketing, um, and then use those customized versions of the resume. And the cool thing about doing that is if you are applying through an applicant tracking system, 
that's a search term that's being positioned relatively early in the document that allows the system to believe, hey, he's got the right title. She's got the right title. Mm-hmm. Let's go further. Uh, and exactly, it just helps with getting through the system because the systems are often uh, trained to believe the earlier in the document the term exists, the more likely it is you've actually done that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's great for applicant tracking systems. It's also great just for humans because they work the exact same way. If you send your resume to somebody and it has a totally random title at the top, chances are they're not going to keep reading to try to discover how you are chief marketing officer. If they see it right at the top, like you said, they're going to read it and say, "Hmm, okay, I'll read a little bit more. Let's read this summary statement and let's read their first job title and go from there. So if you can keep them interested by staying relevant throughout, um, that's a big help. Six seconds or less. I know when I did recruiting, I had it down to four and a half. On occasion, I went over five. And thus, you have to catch their eye early. Otherwise, for me, I went one page down. On occasion, I went two. So you hit page down, not there. Page down. Not there, delete. Yeah, boom, five seconds. Yeah, and a lot of people think that's uh, brutal or unfair that they so what? thirty minutes. Yeah, you know the reality is, uh, we we just posted a job for a reverse recruiter, which is somebody who provides the services that I'm talking about here. Within four hours of that job being posted, we had 450 applicants to go through. There's no way that we can go through 450 applicants every four hours. It would require a 10 person team. I mean, do the math on how many we're basically able to look at it even in a full, you know, full week of somebody full-time working at that. It's ridiculous. And since it's been posted, I mean, it, every week that we repost, it get, it's getting that many applicants in that period of hours. It's, it's ridiculous. So people want to complain about six seconds, but it's just, you know, you need to market yourself knowing that that's the reality. So. When I did my second show, Job Search Radio, the first episode was an interview where I opened opened it talking to my guest. Uh, and I said, on a typical Monday morning, I walk into about 200, 225 resumes. Of those resumes, how many do you think might be vaguely qualified? <laughs> and the answer was two. Uh, yep. And that was just vaguely qualified. I wasn't going to finite, yep. you know, this is the perfect mm-hmm. person. I just, they had some of the terms. It looked like it was I fairly did. recent. Just asked our hiring manager for this position exactly that, you know, how many qualified from that out of the 450 in those four hours. She said that 14, and she said this was much higher than normal. She said she was surprised to see that 14 of the 450 looked decent. That's 1%, right? Am I doing that math right? Or is that 10%? Yeah, one, I don't even know, not 1%, but um, 14 of the 450, a very small percent um, were even remotely qualified. And that's before speaking to them about salary requirements, seeing when they could, so that's before knowing anything of them, just reviewing their resume, 14 of 450. And that's a good, that's on a good day. So 3%, yeah. maybe. Three percent. Yeah. yeah. So, what haven't we covered yet that we really should? Hmm. So, I walked through Friday, Monday, Tuesday through Thursday as our networking days. We spent a lot of time networking. So, we have one day of the week dedicated towards applying to jobs, and three for networking. So, if I haven't emphasized the importance of using LinkedIn and networking, those numbers should say something. One day is used for finding the jobs. One day is used for applying to the jobs, and the three, the other three days of the week are used for networking. For those jobs. So reaching out to people on LinkedIn, finding their emails. Um, so 60% of our week is filled with being on LinkedIn, networking for our clients, trying to get them phone calls with peers, hiring managers. We'll still reach out to the recruiters and HR people as well, just because that's another person that we can touch on. But um, those, are, those are kind of the types of people we're reaching out to, recruiters and HR, peers, and hiring managers. So um, big emphasis on networking. Yeah. And folks, I'll just simply say, you should be doing this every day, the networking every day, because you're not running a business like he is, where he's representing a number of people and his team is representing a number of people concurrently. You're representing you. 
You're not applying to or finding 450 jobs uh, and applying to all of those, tailoring your resume and sending them out on Monday morning. You're applying to a handful, two handfuls. Uh, it doesn't take all day, every day to do that. You could be networking on those days that you're submitting resumes. So, yep. Uh, another thing a lot of people don't realize is that when you're connected with somebody on LinkedIn, you more often than not have access to their contact info. So you have to be a first degree connection. So you have to get that connection. And then there's a section in their profile that says contact info. So if I go to your profile now, I can almost certainly find your email address yep, because email. we're first degree connections, contact info. I won't read it out loud here, but I see your website. I see your phone number. I see your email. I see your birthday. I mean, I can, I have a lot of information by being a first degree connection with you. So sometimes part of your strategy will be spend a day sending invites to everyone that you want to connect with, go back the next day and look and see who's accepted your invite and then message them or get their contact info. Um, adding a note when you send that invite is another big tip that just generally good to do. It helps you stand out in the list of invitations. Um, but you don't want to pitch yourself in that note either, because we found that people are less likely to accept your invite when you're trying to sell something in that note. So a quick note that just says, Hey, Jeff would love to connect here on LinkedIn. Hey, Jeff would love to get connected something super casual that's going to make you stand out, but also not say anything that's like, oh, this guy's going to be annoying. Um, and then you get connected and then you can be annoying. Not really, but you have their email, you have their phone number, you can uh, reach out to them in a few different ways and, until they respond and, and yeah, get in front of them. So. This has been fun, Mike. How can people find out more about you, the work that you do, everything? <laughs> so I'm on LinkedIn, pretty active on there. Feel free to message me or get connected. My name is Mike Podesta. I think I'm pretty much the only one on there. So you can find me that way. Um, findmyprofession.com is our website. If you like what you hear about the reverse recruiting services and the managed job search, we also do resume writing, LinkedIn profile development, and so much more. Um, but that's pretty much it. LinkedIn and, and my website is, is where I'm going to be. So. Super. Mike, thank you. And folks, we'll be back soon with more. I'm Jeff Alpin, the Big Game Hunter. Hope you enjoyed today's interview. If you didn't, you're watching on YouTube. Share it. Leave a comment. Give it a like. Do something that lets people know it was worthwhile. Same thing with the podcast. Share it. Leave a comment. Click the like button. Do something, please. It does help with the algorithms. It does help with discovery. Also want to mention, visit my website, TheBigGameHunter.us, where there is a ton in the blog that you can watch, listen to, or read that will help you. Plus, you can find out about my courses that you can rent or buy. You can find out about my books and guides. There's just a lot of great information there to help you. Plus, you can schedule time for a free discovery call, schedule time for coaching. Like I said, a lot there. Lastly, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash the big game hunter. Have a terrific day. And most importantly, be great. Take care.